Hi, folks. This is Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. I wanted to uh, talk about uh, the new truce proposal, which seems to be positive in terms of its acceptance by both Israel and Hamas. Now, before I read this article, I wanted to give a little bit of uh, eh, my cynicism, I suppose. I am a cynic. Um, it makes me wonder sometimes when I hear these kinds of things, when politicians suddenly make an about face and decide that they want to do something which they said previously that they would not do, if there is some kind of mm, agenda behind it. Certainly Biden knows that he is trailing in the polls or was trailing in the polls. Now that may have changed because of the conviction of Donald Trump. But it does seem like a possibility to me, and I am only speculating that this truce pr proposal was timed to coincide with the end of the case against Donald J. Trump. Now, obviously, no one had any way of knowing what the outcome would be. No one knew whether uh, Donald Trump would be convicted on any of the charges he was accused of. But even if he were not convicted, still, maybe this truce proposal would be even better. Maybe it would look even better for Biden because it would shift the focus away from the fact that Trump was not convicted and on to Biden as a person who is supporting this truce proposal. So either way, I think it looks good for Joe Biden. Either way. Now, I don't know. Um, I have no secret source of information. These are just thoughts that are, have been curdling in my mind that I figured I would mention. But uh, in any event, it is an interesting development. And I hope that it works out. I hope that this damn war is over. I really hope it's over. Now, this is my um, skepticism, I guess, about it. That is that Netanyahu has been presumably continuing the war in order to avoid his trial on corruption charges. Now, if the war does end, if there is a truce between Hamas and Israel, what will happen to King Bibi? I don't know. We'll have to see. So, you know, there's no real way of knowing these things. Because we are just sitting back as passive observers, watching the world play by our eyes, kind of like that uh, old soap opera. It may still be on. I have no idea. I've never been a fan of daytime soap operas. As the world turns. So as the world turns, we can just sit back, observe, and try to guess or maybe speculate. But let me go ahead and uh, read you this article. Uh, it is intriguing. It's been covered by numerous media outlets. They are all pretty much saying the same thing. So again, uh, like the article I read before, uh, this article is from Reuters, uh, which is a pretty fair news outlet. Pretty fair. Um, I still prefer Al Jazeera if I had to pick from mainstream out outlets, I would pick Al Jazeera first. But Reuters is still pretty good, reasonably good, certainly better than, I think, the New York Times, the New York Post, the New York Daily News, MSNBC, CNN, Fox News Channel. But nevertheless, uh, I like Reuters to a certain extent, and this article seems to be pretty good. So, uh, the title is Biden details truce, details Gaza truce proposal. Hamas responds positively. 
It is by Steve Holland and James McKenzie. Dateline, May 31st, 2024. That is today, barely where I am because it's 11.33 p.m., so not far from uh, the 1st of June. It was updated four hours ago. Uh, here is the article. U.S. President Joe Biden on Friday, which is still today where I am, laid out what he described as a three-phase Israeli proposal for a ceasefire in Gaza in return for the release of Israeli hostages, saying it's time for this war to end. It was time for the war to end before it started and winning a positive initial reaction from Hamas. The first phase involves a six-week ceasefire when Israeli forces would withdraw from all populated areas of Gaza. Some hostages, including the elderly and women, would be freed in exchange for hundreds of Palestinian prisoners. Palestinian civilians could return to their homes in Gaza, and 600 trucks a day would bring humanitarian aid into the devastated areas. That is something, as you know, that Israel has been preventing, largely preventing, up until now. In the second phase, Biden said there would be an exchange of all remaining living hostages. I don't know why that there is a need to put living in there, but how, what is a dead hostage? I have no idea how a dead person can be a hostage, but in any event, of all remaining living hostages, including male soldiers, Israeli forces would withdraw from Gaza and the permanent ceasefire would begin. Let me read that clause of the sentence again. And the permanent ceasefire Permanent ceasefire would begin. A third phase would include a would include a major reconstruction plan for Gaza and the return of the final remains of hostages to their families. It's time for this war to end and for the day after to begin, said Biden. Makes me think of that horrible movie. The day after, it's a kind of a lousy choice of words, in my opinion. Continuing, who was under election year pressure to stop the Gaza conflict, now in its eighth month. Its eighth month. You know, it doesn't seem like it's been that long. I think when things are unfolding so rapidly, when there is so much suffering, so much death, Time appears to pass rapidly. Of course, it's only a mental illusion. Time doesn't pass fastly or slowly, fast or slowly, but it appears to be pass passing rather fast, uh, at least to me. Hamas, which Biden said received the proposal from Qatar, released a statement reacting positively. Hamas said it was ready to engage positively and in a constructive manner with any proposal based on a permanent ceasefire, withdrawal of Israeli forces, the reconstruction of Gaza, a return of those displaced, and a quote-unquote genuine prisoner swap deal if Israel clearly announces a commitment to such deal. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's office said he had authorized his negotiating team to present the deal, while insisting that the war will not end until all its goals are achieved, including the return of all our hostages and the destruction of Hamas's military, and governmental capabilities. Pause. Okay, now, 
the ceasefire deal was agreed to by Hamas. Now, Netanyahu is saying, we want Netanyahu decapitated, turned into a non-existent organization. How in the world does King Bibi expect Hamas to agree to a proposal which would mean its own destruction? I don't know, but what I would say, bear in mind that these are only preliminary statements. We don't know anything until we know. It could be puffing. Could be puffing. Netanyahu could be puffing. Meaning just basically saying things to make himself look big. On the other hand, if he is not puffing, if he is serious, if he genuinely means that he expects Hamas basically to go out of business, then I don't see how would Hamas or how could Hamas agree to such a deal? I don't think it should or would. But again, these are simply the early hours of the proposal. We don't know what will happen. Continuing, separately, the Israeli military said its forces have ended operations in North Gaza's Jabalia area after days of intense fighting while probing further into Rafa in South Gaza to target what they say is the last major Hamas redoubt. The conflict began on October 7th when gunmen led by the Islamist Palestinian group stormed into southern Israel on motorcycles, paragliders, and four-wheel drive vehicles, killing 1,200 people and abducting more than 250, according to Israeli tallies. Israel then invaded the Gaza Strip in what Netanyahu has called an effort to destroy Hamas, the militant Palestinian group that seized control of the area from the Fatah Palestinian faction in a violent struggle in 2007. Talks mediated by Egypt, Qatar, and others to arrange a ceasefire between Israel and Hamas have repeatedly stalled, with each side blaming the other for the lack of progress. Pause. No, I, I mean, certainly Israel could blame Hamas, but then it's being disingenuous. Then it is being disingenuous. The lack of progress is entirely due, well, let me rephrase that, is almost entirely due to the efforts by Israel to get what it wanted while not conceding any territory at all to Hamas. So I don't buy that. I don't buy what Israel is claiming. In his speech, Biden called on the Israeli leadership to resist pressure from those in Israel who were pushing for the war to go on, quote unquote, indefinitely, a group he said included some of the Israeli governing coalition. That is the part of the article I was waiting to discuss. So let me pause there and address that specifically. The Netanyahu government, which is technically a Likud government, it is technically a government of the Likud party, is only run by the Likud party by a technicality. In other words, without those other right-wing parties, Netanyahu and Likud would not be in charge. And repeatedly, those other right-wing parties have said, Netanyahu, if you end this war in Gaza, then we will pull out of your government 
causing your government to fall. That's what they've said. Now, has that suddenly gone away? Again, I don't know. We have so little information to go on. I've been trying to compile this stuff, but every source I've looked at basically says the same thing. So I can't find any information, including in Israeli media, which explains what these other parties are saying that they will do. Are they still planning on pulling out? If so, the present government of the Likud party will fall and this entire plan will fail. I don't know. I have no idea. So Biden is making this call. It is not clear whether Bibi Netanyahu is willing to go along with it because by going along with it, it appears to me that he must realize that he will pay a price, a personal price, meaning the trial will start for his corruption charges. I shouldn't even say charges. The trial will start for his corruption. Netanyahu is a very corrupt man. I don't think that's political. I think that's pretty common knowledge. Even in Israel, Biden must know that, that Netanyahu is a very corrupt man and two-faced. He might say one thing now and something else tomorrow he, because he has done that repeatedly. So I don't know what will happen, but again, we'll see. He, meaning Biden, implored Israel, Israelis, not to miss the chance for a ceasefire. As the only American president who has ever gone to Israel at a time of war, pause. Is that something he's proud of? Is that something that Biden is proud of? Okay, I will say this. I have not wanted to say this, but I will say it. I think it's a, it is a fair statement. I will not go to Israel because I don't accept Israel. So I will not go to a place that I don't accept. I will leave it at there without any elaboration. All of my friends know that. All of my friends know that. Because I have some friends who have been trying to push me to go to Israel one, two weeks ago. And when I said what I just said, she reacted in horror. She goes there apparently once a year, once a year. I wouldn't step foot in the country. If I were not an American, I would also not step foot in the United States because of the things that we are doing, because of the fact that we are keeping unindicted, unconvicted prisoners in Guantanamo Bay, in a part of Cuba that is, I guess, sort of owned by the United States. So, again, I, I, I don't know what to make of this whole thing, but I guess we'll, we'll see. I, I made my point against my better judgment, to be honest, but I made my point and I will leave it at that. The Gaza war has put Biden in a political bind. You don't say. On the one hand, he has long been a staunch supporter of Israel. Again, you don't say. And would like to ensure funding and support from the pro-Israeli community in the United States in his November 5th election rematch against Republican former President Donald Trump. Once again, you don't say. Okay, pause. When you're looking at the pro-Israeli community in the United States, basically APAC, primarily APAC, how many people in APAC are going to vote for Biden when Donald Trump is in the election? I will leave it there. 
how many people will do that? Does Biden not realize that he is running against a guy who was really well liked by APAC? So if he thinks that doing this is going to bring him support from APAC, I think he has something coming. But that's just my own opinion. On the other hand, progressive elements of Biden's Democratic Party have grown increasingly angry at the president for the suffering the conflict has caused civilians in Gaza. Palestinian health authorities estimate that more than 36,280 people have been killed in Gaza since Israel attacked. And the United Nations says over a million people face, quote unquote, catastrophic levels of hunger as famine takes hold in parts of the enclave. By the enclave, of course, is meant Gaza. Signaling a U.S. effort to build support for the proposal, the State Department said U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken spoke with his Jordanian, Saudi, and Turkish counterparts. Speaking to the Turkish foreign minister, he emphasized that Hamas should accept the deal and that every country with a relationship with Hamas should press it to do so without delay, the State Department said, in a sign of support for Israel. Despite the partisan divide in the U.S., leaders of the Democratic-led U.S. Senate and the Republican-led House of Representatives on Friday invited Netanyahu to address a joint meeting of Congress? Yeah. Read that again. Both the U.S. Senate led by Democrats, and the U.S. House of Representatives, led by Republicans, have invited Bibi Netanyahu to address a joint meeting of Congress. If anything tells you that the United States lives under a duopoly, a duopoly basically meaning two parties which are basically one, that's how it's commonly used. We may talk about two different parties, but how different are they really? Uh, I would agree with that, which is why I am a commie. I do not support either party. In fact, I don't support any party. I am a Maoist third worldist, and we don't have a party. We are simply a bunch of friends, mostly YouTube podcasters, so we don't have a party. But uh, I do not support either one of them. I am not a member of either one of them. Not only that, I have never been a member of any political party in my entire life. Never. And never will be. Okay, continuing. Um, well, I think I'll stop it there. I will stop it there. There's... There's a final announcement at the end, which I was thinking about reading, but I think that I will uh, not do that and uh, end my reading of the story there. Uh, it is That basically makes, makes the point. Um, I really hope, as somebody who loves the third world and loves the fourth world, and Gaza is both, as I'm sure you know. I really hope that this is the end. The problem is, even if there is a truce, even if this is the end of the current conflict, what is there to guarantee that on some made-up thing, whether maybe even on some legitimate thing, I shouldn't say made up, that shows my bias, but on some 
idea that Israel will not go into Gaza again. I don't know. I am not very optimistic. The Labour Party, which is supposedly like the Democratic Party in the U.S., which basically means they're not really a Labour Party in the, in the sense of the Labour Party in Britain. The Labour Party in, in, the, um, in Israel basically has no power. It is very, very unlikely that at any time in the immediate future that a Labour Party candidate will become the Prime Minister. The Labour Party has a very small number of seats in the Knesset, which, of course, is the Israeli parliament. Um, there are parties, of course, much further to the left that exist in Israel, including some communist parties. They have no power at all, just like in the United States. Although I have always said, and as far as I know, at least for the time being, will always say, that the United States is a right-wing country, which I realize contradicts what many U.S. progressives say when they say, oh, no, the U.S. is really a left-wing country. I would like to know what they mean by left-wing. Obviously, even if I use an expansive definition of left-wing, which in reality I never do, when I say left-wing... I mean communist. I mean revolutionary socialist. I do not mean social democratic, progressive, or anything of the sort. The Green Party is not a left-wing party, for example. Um, Jill Stein is not a left-wing candidate. And yet I see all over YouTube people saying, vote for Jill Stein. Why? Jill Stein can't win because the U.S is run by a duopoly. I mean, that's fine. People want to vote for Jill Stein, make themselves feel better. The best tactic, in my opinion, and again, this is only my opinion, obviously, is don't vote at all. Now, I don't not vote as a protest. Some people don't vote as a protest, but not me. I don't vote because I don't think that voting will make any difference. If I genuinely thought that voting would, would matter, I would consider voting. I would consider voting. I'm not saying I would, but I would consider it. I would ruminate on the subject a bit. Whether I would vote, I have no idea. I can't conceive I can't imagine myself in a position of being a voter in the United States. If I were, God forbid, living in Israel, I certainly can't imagine myself voting in that country. But being an American, obviously I can register to vote. I can go to the polls in November. But why would I? Why would I? I could always vote. Always. But I never have. Because I don't want to. I don't want to. It does not matter. Because elections. Are not the route to communism. You can't vote in communism. Even if you vote for a supposed communist. Somebody who is. A communist. Uh, by name. They're not really a communist. What Or if they are, if they are, let's say somebody claims to be a communist and is running for president. What they are doing, in case you didn't know this, they know they won't win. They are running to increase their popularity and to bring in more members to their party. For example... There was, I forget his name, I should remember it and I can't, it was a long time ago. There was a Trotskyist 
who was um, running for U.S. president a couple of couple of election cycles ago, and his partner in crime, his vice presidential candidate, was thirty seven years old. I'm sorry, not thirty seven. Twenty seven years old, not thirty seven. Twenty seven years old. What does that mean? Well, could they be elected? I guess so. As far as I know, there is no rule which prohibits a vice president from being under 35. But say the president died. The vice president could not succeed the president. It would go to the um well, it would it would go to the Speaker of the House. The Speaker of the House of whatever party would succeed the party, uh, the President of the United States, and become the new president. So that told me right away, these people are not serious. They don't care about winning because they're smart. They know that they won't win. They are simply trying to grow as a party. So no, no, I won't vote. But by the same token, I hope, I genuinely hope that this despicable operation in Gaza will end. More than anything else in the world, I must say right now, there's nothing that I want more than that. Nothing. Right now. Right now. I mean, that may change tomorrow. Something else may come to the light and I may change my mind. There is nothing that I want more right now than for the war or terrorist campaign, call it what you will, to end now or as soon as possible. The entire issue surrounding Trump, which is captivating the minds and hearts of so many people, is way, way down the list. Maybe it's secondary. But secondary is way, way down, way, way down from wanting the war against Gaza to end. Now, of course, it's called a war against Hamas, but Hamas is still very much alive. People who've been killed are average Gazans, including children, including babies and in incubators. So, again, I care about Gaza. And that's really all right now. And so if this proposal by Biden, whatever his reasons or intentions, even if he's doing it in, in his mind to increase his chances of being elected or reelected in November, so what? Good. If that's his reason, I don't care what his reason is. If the war on Gaza ends, I will be happy. For the time being, this has been Mark by Mark A. Foster, Ph.D. for the Institute for Dialectical Metarealism. Have a pleasant day and an even better day tomorrow.